Close by is another statue donated by the French Grand Orient Temple Masons to the Masons of America, celebrating the first Masonic Republic called the United States of America. Fourteen U.S. presidents, including George Washington, are known to be 33rd degree Masons. <laughs> Leopold and Nathaniel Rothschild became the next generation of godfathers to take charge of the family fortune. They were like the Parker brothers of Monopoly, and they played the game like they invented it. The brothers were the world champions, and that's because they knew the secret to winning. The secret to winning was to cheat, and the best way to cheat was to become the banker and rewrite the rules. So that's exactly what they did. Since the U.S. Congress was already in charge of the rules and the Federal Reserve Bank, Winning the U.S. version of Monopoly meant they would have to outsmart Congress. So they sent Jacob Schiff, their trusted lifelong friend and neighbor from Frankfurt, Germany, to New York City, and they put him in charge of their friend company called Kuhn and Loeb. Then they ganged up with other big players by investing in Rockefeller Oil, Harriman Railroads, Carnegie Steel, and Brown Brothers Investment Banking. By 1901, the Rothschilds had amassed $22.2 billion in U.S. assets. The mayor of New York, John Hyland, called them the invisible government, while Congressman Louis McFadden called them a dark crew of financial pirates who would slit a man's throat to get a dollar. When Woodrow Wilson became president of the United States in 1912, he sold out America. Wilson was backed by Jacob Schiff and Paul Warburg, who worked in the United States as German immigrant agents for the Rothschilds. In 1913, Paul Warburg rewrote the U.S. monopoly rules with the help of Senator Nelson Aldrich. They called the new rules the Federal Reserve Act. With President Woodrow Wilson's blessing, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank became a privately owned central bank, free of government control. The pirates divvied up the private stock in America's money supply and made Rothschild agent Paul Warburg head of the U.S. Federal Reserve. To collect their bounty, they also created the Income Tax Act and the hated IRS. With the stroke of President Wilson's treasonous pen, the banker gangsters became the Fed in 1913 and have owned a virtual monopoly over the U.S. economy and the taxpayers' money ever since. They can print money out of thin air, control treasury loans, and profit from interest rates. Since their biggest windfalls come from loan profits and weapons sales, wars and death are not only profitable, they're desirable and necessary. Today, American citizens owe these merchants of death approximately $70,000 per citizen. Yeah. 
Leute tragen, den deutschen Staat das unverschriebenste Leid Adolf Hitler wasn't the only madman to rule over Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm II led Germany to its destruction in World War I. Crippled since birth with a useless arm, Kaiser Wilhelm was the grandson of Queen Victoria and the great uncle of today's Queen Elizabeth II. It was no accident that Kaiser Wilhelm chose Max Warburg as head of Germany's secret service. The Warburgs and the Rothschilds controlled Germany's central bank called the Reichsbank, which was founded by Mayor Rothschild. While Max and Felix Warburg helped finance Germany in World War I, their brother Paul Warburg of Kuhn and Loeb helped finance the American side by selling war bonds through the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. The Rothschild and Warburg printing presses worked tirelessly on both sides of the Atlantic, rolling out debt money. Germany won the First World War by 1916 without a single shot being fired on German soil. British convoys were blown out of the Atlantic by German subs, the French army mutinied, and the Russian army was defecting. With British Prime Minister Lloyd George up against a wall, Lionel Rothschild and the Jewish Zionists offered the British a deal they couldn't refuse. We'll bring the United States into the war as your ally and win the war for you, they said, if you'll promise us Palestine. In April of 1917, President Wilson got the green light and declared war on Germany. Because of overwhelming opposition to the war, Wilson invoked the draft and passed the Espionage Act, forcing Americans to fight or be thrown in jail. Billions of U.S. taxpayers' money was delivered to the British war machine, money that was never repaid. In return, the British government wrote the famous Balfour Declaration and addressed it to none other than Lord Lionel, Rothschild. The declaration promised Palestine and Israel to the Rothschild Zionists. The Zionists believe that they are entitled to the land of Israel because according to the Bible Israel was promised to the Jews by God and according to the Bible the Jews are God's chosen race of people a race favored by God above all others. In 1917 Lord Allenby conquered the Holy Land and the Jews were promised the national home in Palestine by the Earl of Balfour a policy endorsed by Woodrow Wilson and by the League of Nations, which made Palestine a British mandate. The Versailles Treaty negotiations after World War I were held behind closed doors at the luxurious private mansion of yet another Rothschild family member named Edmund Rothschild. Treaty negotiators included Rothschild agent Paul Warburg as a United States delegate and Paul's brother Max Warburg as a German delegate. Clemenceau, Lord George and President Wilson have pulled up armchairs and crouched low over the map. It is appalling that these ignorant and irresponsible men should be cutting Asia Minor to bits as if they were dividing a cake. During the afternoon, there is the final revision of the frontiers of Austria. Hungary is partitioned, indolently, irresponsibly partitioned. Then the Yugoslav frontier. Then tea and macaroons. The Versailles Peace Treaty forced Germany to accept guilt for the war. As punishment, Germany lost its army, navy and colonies and had to pay the cost of the war through a debt to the gangster banksters that could never be repaid. World War I killed nine million soldiers, injured, crippled and impoverished millions and collapsed four empires with large parts of France, Belgium and Russia left devastated. Wars throughout history have always been waged by the ruling master class for conquest, power, and profit. And the subject class have always fought their battles. It wasn't until the close of World War I that soldiers began to ask why they were killing and being killed. 